Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. It is, uh, it's good to have a fresh start. Um, so yesterday I posted a big question mark on my Instagram, uh, trying to get some more questions from all of you. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, there is, uh, There's quite a few questions. Ah. What's the fastest you've shaped a board from start to finish? Uh, as always, I've got an interesting story. When um, back in the days when I was at GNS and Bolton Colburn rode uh, rode for GNS, uh, he went to Australia in March of. 80, I guess. And he came back just spewing stories about Simon's trifin. It was the first, you know, I think it was one of the first ones. And uh, he got him to Skip's ear about shaping it. You know, he came in, I was there, Skip was there, and he, the surf was really good. And I could tell Skip was jonesing to get out of the factory. And, and, uh, but Bolton, Bolton just like, he was just so excited and so fired up. Uh, so Skip dropped everything and started shaping Bolton the board, and I swear he shaped it. You know, Skip takes his time. <laughs> he takes two or three out of how many hours to do a board. But this is a short board. It's like 5, 10 or something. I think Skip spent 20 minutes on it. He says, there you go, Bolton. I'm out of here. <laughs> So 20 minutes back, even back then, it was pretty quick. And I know there's guys out there that tout, uh, you know, two boards in an hour. And I, I was never really about timing myself. It was about getting the board right. And, uh, you know, for, for, for years what I'd do is I'd rough out a board and look at it and then put it in a corner and come back at it with fresh eyes either later in the day or uh, the next day. But uh, to answer your question, I, I think 30 minutes, you know, I, I maybe 25 minutes. And uh, I was, I mean, it kind of, it, it was kind of intentional. I just kind of wanted to push myself. But I think... And and uh, and I'll tie another story into this. I uh, this is at the, one of the board house boardroom uh, shows a few years back in Del Mar, and I believe it was right when Ryan Birch was fresh to the shaping world. I I just heard of his name, and I don't think he'd shaped that many boards. And I I watched his. He he was one of the um, people that put on a live performance and. Uh, I watched his shaping, and it, this is five, six, seven years ago, whatever, and I'm sure his skills have improved greatly, but he, I watched him, and he had like this almost attack the blank mode into his shaping. But I, I was intrigued because I could tell that he saw the finished product in the blank, and he he... He, he went, out, went at it pretty hard and rough, but the end product was what he wanted. I mean, I think it was what he, was want, what he wanted, but it, you know, that people get so worried about, the only detail they get worried about, you know, you guys get worried about today is volume, which is, <laughs> you know, my feelings on that, but, uh, uh, the deep, you know, uh, I, yeah, once again, I think uh, boards don't need to be symmetrical, you know, you're, you're, for obvious reasons. They do because they need to be sold in stores and, you know, it doubles your chances of selling the board or almost doubles it if you have it symmetrical. It's a sign of craftsmanship, but really at the end of the day, uh, I've had some interesting experiences with accidental <laughs> asymmetricals. But, um, you know, back to your original question, how long does it take? I, you know, I, 
I used to spend about an hour on a short board and an hour and a half on a semi gun and a couple, of two and a half hours on a gun. And, um, but that, you know, that was after at least a thousand boards. So, um, and the, and the beauty of, sh I think of shaping is most boards you can do in one sitting. And like I said, for years, I would put, put them aside when they're halfway done. Uh, but if you have someone that comes in for a shaping appointment, you can pretty much do it start to finish in front of that person. And it just, it fits into our, uh, Attention is the average person's attention span. You know, it, 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 from the first thing you do when you touch the blank, I mean, usually when they come in, they're, you know, kind of, unless they've been there a few times to the factory, they're kind of like overwhelmed. But uh, it, I'd say the average guy hand shaping is maybe an hour and a half, and that's a perfect time frame. I mean, after about an hour and a half, you, you know, you start to get tired, physically tired, you start to get, uh, you know, maybe a little mentally uh, fatigued, but uh, yeah, it's a nice, you know, in terms of building something, it's a nice time frame. Uh, I'm deciding between a 419 fish or a heckler, 5'5". Five, five. Uh, the 419 is pretty much a traditional fish. It's got, uh, I believe that, you know, the tail should be pulled, you know. If you look at a traditional fish, the tail corners are too far apart. The boards are too flat, or, you know. And they, you know, they're designed to ride a certain way, and that they do. Uh, I pull my corners in a little bit, add a little bit more tail rocker. I don't have much nose rocker and they're fairly high volume for the length. Um, the heckler is more of a semi-fish, and it has a bit more rocker than the 419, and you will get more vertical play out of the heckler. It's not, it's not a high-performance shortboard, but it for a... a, a performance fish you'll get um, you know you'll get some vertical play from it and uh, tighter turns uh, they're both very popular boards and you know I a lot of people get uh, I mean they, they can really only afford one board and they look you know, they go through the social media, they look at people's websites. And uh, I think the average person is highly, uh, what's the word? They, uh, they're not taking into consideration how average the surf is most of the time. I mean, we all have our seasons, you know, Australia is kind of the opposite of ours, uh, or, you know, it, uh, Southern Hemisphere is kind of the opposite of ours up here in the Northern Hemisphere, but, you know, for us, we get good surf in uh, November and, and December, and especially, I think, for Southern California, January has always been the best month. Uh, and then the rest of the year, it's kind of hit and miss. It's kind of, you're kind of, hang on a second, what? I was talking to the dog. I know, she likes to be in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, you think about how many days you, you, you surf and how many days are great and how many days are kind of average. And I think you should consider when you order a board, if you're, if you're, you know, if your budget allows only one board, that you should probably consider, you know, an alternative board or a fun board, uh, something with a little bit more width and thickness and maybe maybe a tight, well, maybe not but much longer, but the, the, uh, a little bit of extra width, certainly a little bit of extra thickness, and the rocker too. You drop your rocker a little bit 
and you'll have you'll have a lot more fun on the average days, and it'll still handle the uh, the bigger, better days. Not ideally like a board geared for that, but you can still surf. I mean, I. 1970, I made my first twin fin, and I I took it out of Blacks, and it was a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, and I was blown away at how well the twin fin worked, and I remember it being six to eight foot, but I don't know, it was probably about four foot, but, uh, you know, twin, uh, you know, the two fin or four fin boards have, especially the four fin boards have great range. Uh, there... There's a fella, uh, Mick Jones from us. I'm not sure where Mick Jones is from. Michael Jones. Asking about Jonathan Govins. And uh, for you that are, are, uh, aren't aware of Jonathan, he's a, a, he's a Peruvian team. Writer, and he recently turned 40, but he's on the smaller side and Mick wants to know what the dimensions or the design breakdown of Jonathan's wards are and uh, he's been riding a traveler for a long time he's small so his boards are anywhere from 5'4 to 5'7 five, 5'7 seven, five, seven and a half and close to 18 and, and so he you know he makes a medium sized barrel look big but he gets he gets barreled there's no doubt about it. And there's plenty of video uh, online about him. And uh, so, yeah, his boards are uh, close to 18 and uh, two and a quarter, sometimes less. And he has been riding the Traveler. We're going to try and get him on a Blackbird. Uh, the uh, board he's been really loving lately is the Blade 4 channel. Uh, of course, you know, 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five and in the low 18s but he's he's a great guy he's got tons of video on it i just googled jonathan gubbins g-u-b-b-i-n-s uh and yeah he's he's uh, i think a couple of years ago he's voted one of the best free free surfers in the world but he's he's shocked <laughs> he gets uh Oh, and Nick also had a question. Uh, using your definition of a step-down board, which featured a double concave and a tail, how would you choose to end the tail block? Run it to the door or blend it into a panel V or run it in the flat? I, virtually all of my designs, I mean, some of them, he's asking how I, on the bottom, how, what the transition is, you know, maybe like concave to double barrel. And he's asking what the last three six maybe inches but especially as you go through the rear fin i uh, i think i think the tail needs a little bit of release which means a little bit of convex in the bottom it's ever so slight but uh, it helps you transition through the turns if you have a flat tail uh it, you know it'll feel okay but i think if you have a concave running through the tail it gets a little sticky or messy on the rail transition. And uh, so therefore, I think most of my designs have from never, I really rarely have more than uh, a, a medium. You know, I, I define slight as between zero and, and point 0.1 and medium is point 0.1 to point 0.2 and heavy is point 0.2 to point 0.3. Uh, whether it's concave or uh, Convex, so um, I would choose on a step down board, especially uh, a light panel V. But as I said, I tend to it, it, it the bottoms are they're pretty complex, I, I think. But they you, you watch the transition as the board comes into the fin area, is is you know, it develops a double, like a double V, 24 inches up from the fins, and as it as it comes, it, it peaks about 24, 30 inches up, and then as it comes through the fins, it starts to shallow out a little bit, and then as it passes through the fins, it starts to flatten out, and then it finishes with a very slight convex, and that's a 
that's a good bottom for most boards. Although we have some boards that are full single concaves that are, are popular too. Um, Oh, uh, okay. Chris. Chris Sheeper uh, has a question. He likes to, he wants to hear my thoughts on mid lengths for average all around surf. Uh, yeah, it kind of it kind of touches back on my last uh, point uh, well, a few points ago that the average you know the average day is uh, pretty lacking in energy and. You know, getting a shorter, wider, flatter board is one way to uh, get, uh, you know, more performance out of your board. But the mid-length thing, you know, I'd say, uh, for argument's sake, seven to eight feet long. And you want width, and you want some th some thickness. They don't have to be super thick. The width will help the board plane as long as well as the lower rocker. Uh, thickness always isn't, uh, uh, you know, excessive thickness isn't always to your advantage uh, in the surf. Um, I the, the new series, the new, new, new <laughs> egg that I'm doing is, uh, is mid-length. It's wider. Uh, it's a little bit flatter than the old, uh, than uh, a, a regular board. It's a little bit more rocker than the older boards. And it's also a little bit thinner, uh, thinner in the rails, thinner in the center. And I think, I think it's, I think it's great that all of these uh, younger surfers and newer shapers are experimenting with them because they're, <clears throat> heck, they're a lot more fun on the average day. And you can ride them in good surf. I mean, we, back in the day, we used to, Right, a pretty good surf. They don't, you know, a, se a seven six uh, mid length board isn't going to fit the barrel of Big Rock as good as a five ten. But you can ride them out there. Joel does. <laughs> uh, how has it? This is from Kahuna. Josh, uh, how? Has it been adapting to different board designs from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s through today? Uh, well, the first decade I shaped, uh, I worked off of uh, just a handful of numbers, you know, nose, tail, center width, nose, tail, center thickness. And I wasn't really that savvy to rocker back in the early days I was shaping uh, I used to eyeball it <laughs> as I think most shapers did and uh, you know just get in there, I just get in there and hack away and you know as, as, as the years went by I started building my uh, stock of templates uh, so that was the first decade I shaped and then in 1979 I had the Delightful experience to meet Bill Barnfield. He um, seventy nine was kind of a crazy year. There, there was the uh, Stubby's Invitational at Blacks, and uh, I got asked to be one of the judges. Uh, La Jolla Surf's La Jolla Surf and Sport opened up, uh, kind of a, a block down on Pearl from Mitch's, and uh, uh, guy. I think the guy's name was Guy Hanson. I can't, I can't. He opened it. But he got in touch with Debbie Millville, who was writing Bill's boards at the time. And Bill was um, arguably um, maybe not the most popular shaper on the North Shore in the late 70s, but he was definitely one of them. And he uh, was a, a very analytical shaper. Very. He... And that appealed to me because my father was a mathematician. So I, you know, he came over here and I let him use my shaping room. And then I, uh, a few months later, I went to Hawaii and he let me use his shaping room and and then actually uh, asked me if I'd help him with some of his orders. And uh, I got a pretty good uh, 
advanced course in shaping. But he, he, uh, I mean, it got so insane that I don't even think he measured as much as I did, but I, I started measuring and I started getting hooked on it. And I, I had measurements, width, thickness, rocker measurements every six inches. Uh, and I was, especially like the rocker, uh, and uh, I was a disciple, you know, being controlled by that many numbers uh, through most of the 80s. And then the KKL machine came along and uh, it was good, but it had its problems. You know, if you gave them, they we couldn't program. They, they could, I guess, but we couldn't. Uh, but we'd send a master to them to be scanned and the computer slash machine would do a pretty good job of uh, copying the master. But as you went up or down the scale, you know, once you got past two or three inches, it started to distort. So you had, we ended up having to have quite a few uh, masters with KKL in the late 80s. And um, I, I, uh, I mean, at that time, I, I was, you know, 80, late 85, I left Canyon. And I had a couple of, I hate to call them ghost shapers because I've always openly given my team credit and drop their names or on our website. And I believe I've got some true masters shaping for me. But uh, the, so in the late 80s, I had so much business, I had 10 shapers. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I, I go, you know, I'm taking money out of their pockets by using the shaping machine. And, you know, Gary Linden was big at the time, and Al Merrick, of course, was big. And uh, uh, he was transitioning off of Tom Curran, but he was still pretty big. And uh, but I just decided to stop using the machine. And uh, went to, back just to strictly hand shape. And you know, as I said, I have I had you know six, eight, ten shapers working on working for me, depending on the time of year. And every one of them, I, I could go. I could look. I, if they didn't sign it, if the boards weren't signed, or uh, they didn't have a card on them, I could tell every everyone's style. Every, everyone's. Uh, you know, style of shaping, you know, and some of them look more like mine and others just kind of look kind of like mine. But, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was from the late eighties into the mid nineties. And, uh, I, uh, I figured it was time to get back on the machine because there's just a little bit too much variation in the designs. And then around 99, 2000 came along and uh, uh, this Brazilian fellow named Luciano Leal uh, had sold a couple machines, I think to Eric Arakawa and actually Matt Biolis. And uh, the beauty of it though is you could program your own board. So the, and the software was deceptively simple. I mean, you could kind of learn the basics, but after a while, if you really, you know, worked hard, uh, you could get boards that are pretty tight. And uh, so I used, I used, uh, I, I bought one of Luciano's machines and software. Uh, a couple of, a couple of my other shapers uh, learned the software too, Rick Hammond and uh, my son. Well, he wasn't shaped. He was playing baseball, but um, so that machine worked good for us for several years, and then uh, Mickey <laughs> Mickey uh, came out of the scene with his his uh, his um, and it's by a Frenchman. Uh, his father was a, a computer, his engineer, computer guy too, and uh, so the software is from him and. And Mickey uh, uh, developed the machine, and uh, 
so we bought one of those and got the software. And it's, it's too, it's fairly, the software is fairly straightforward, but over the years it's become more uh, uh, sophisticated. And, uh, you know, people go, oh, man, JP is the best. It's after 40 years of, well, I started hand, I shaved my hand, shaved my first born in late 69, but through the 70s, through the, most of the 80s, I did a lot of hand shaping. I did it at least, in, except for a few years when I was at UCSD, I did a couple uh, thousand, 1,500 boards myself a year, and uh, sometimes more. And uh, you know, after 20, 30,000 boards, your body starts to break down. And uh, it used to be a common, not a joke, but, you know, hey, have you had your hip replaced yet? Uh, or how's your tendonitis, it's, uh, uh, shaping is physical. And, and so I can see how when you first start, you're very excited and you want to do it all by hand. But uh, back to where I was originally going with this is the software is so tight and the machine is, it's not perfect. It doesn't, it doesn't cut perfect, but it cuts a lot better and more accurately than uh, I think, you know, the best hand shaper on the best day. Uh, but there's still, I, I call it about a 5% uh, uh, variance in what you get off the machine. So those of you that are squawking about a half a liter, the machine already takes care of the half a liter. It, 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 <laughs> Every cut isn't exactly the same, but they're close. They're within a 5% tolerance. And the finish work is probably maybe a 10% tolerance. Not everybody's going to scrub the same amount of foam off as the next guy. But all in all, the, uh, so, you know, the, the new generations of software and the machines are, uh, I think, for me, after shaping so many years and shaping so many boards, are fantastic. Uh, even if you even if you uh, don't actually use a machine, but you can get uh, a layman's version free off the internet of the software, and you can use it as a tool to record numbers and play with numbers. Like look at the you can look at the board on the screen if it doesn't look right, what what it is, where the apex of the rocker is, and how the flow is, and you know what the what the rocker is at 18 inches up from the tail and uh, you know you can look at all those details and use them as a guideline for your hand shaping and uh, so <laughs> uh, I got a little bit carried away in that answer but um, yeah so you know today I, uh, I, I you know even my most hardcore I mean, Rick Hammond, he's, he's a genius shaper, and he's he learned to use the software a long time ago. And there was a while when Rick, you know, kind of pushed back on the machine boards, but he he programs every board he shapes now. <laughs> you know, he's been at it longer than me. Uh, uh, but, you know, there's something, something to be said for, you know, head shaping because... Every board was different, and some boards worked better than others, and significantly better than others. And it was like a good learning process. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm a firm, I'm a big fan of the computer shaping. Um, Okay, uh, enjoy life now, 2009. What are some of the signs that your board has too much volume? Um, yeah, I, I uh, if you've listened to me before, I have a big issue with the volume. It's a good tool if you have some experience, you know, if you've had five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten boards, uh, and you you know you've owned them you've gotten to know them but 
especially when you're starting out, uh, volume is your friend. Uh, and I really don't think, well, you, you can have too much volume and the board's really hard to handle. Uh, but when you're first starting out, plus volume is a good thing. And as you age, volume is a good thing. I have guys that are 60, God bless them, they, they, they're, they're ordering a, a six foot, 19 and a half, or 19 inch wide uh, SD. And, you know, after I talk to them for a little while, they end up on something a little bit bigger. But, um, but to get to the point, you know, if you're a more experienced surfer and you're born has too much volume, it's, it's much harder to get your rail in the water, which is a you know key component of surfing. You take off, you drop in, and then you bank your board and drive your rail in the water, and then at some point you let it release. And the boards with too low volume, uh, they they almost get too deep in the water and they're a little bit slow on the bounce back. Uh, boards with too much volume, it's hard to set the rail, and uh, especially in bigger, more powerful surf. Uh, so that's that's the simple answer. But um, I want to bring up a point. Like when I, you know, forever, but the first 10 or so years I surfed, 10, 20 years, I, I'm a, I'm a bigger guy, so it's hard for me to swap boards with somebody in the water. There's a few guys I could, but I always encourage people to try as many different boards as they can. You know, some, some of the... Uh, some of the shapers out there are great. Some are on Kool Aid, and uh, and now with the social media, it's uh, there's a lot of shapers on the Kool Aid. But um, when you yeah, when you're first starting out, it's good to try as many different shapes as you can because you might think you need a high performance shortboard. But at the end of the day, you're really just all about cruising and getting your wave count up and having fun. So, uh, you know, the the volume chart on on Brothers Shaping website says, well, you should be at 28 liters. But in reality, you have a lot more fun at 36 or 40 liters. Uh, so you're, you know, so you, so you can't surf like, uh, John, John, <laughs> there's not many people that can, but, uh, you, you I, I see a lot of guys that as they develop, they just, they kind of develop into cruisers, but they have, and they have a bit of style, but they do, they do some pretty, uh, key maneuvers. I mean, there's, uh, uh, how even Joe, <laughs> Joe Lazar, he, uh, yeah, for, was, this is like in the 70s and 80s he rode a longboard at Black's and he'd sit outside and he'd wait and he he didn't his wave count wasn't high he wasn't a pig he was great actually he was very considerate but he'd wait outside and he'd get the biggest sets of the day and he'd fucking get barreled out of his mind and each wave kick out and then casually paddle back outside and wait uh, um, and you know, I, I've known Joe for, I don't know, 40, 45 years. Uh, and he went on a few of our minimized trips with us. <laughs> you know, one time he brought, uh, he, he brought like a uh, an 86 that I'd made him, but it was a little bit, it was kind of a semi, semi-gun longboard. But he brought a 710 molded board that is, was his wife's. You know, I looked at the board and I shook my head, but we were out of thunders one day and he was sitting deepest and he was getting barreled. And kind of like J.P. O'Brien, he wants to get the wave of the, <coughs> excuse me, the wave of the winter on his, on his wave storm or whatever it is he rides. Um, <clears throat> so instead of, I'm kind of getting off track a little bit. I don't, I think as you're starting out, you need to have an open mind with, with the volume really. Uh, because face it, you know, when you're starting out, you're the pyramid. I always talk about the best guys are the point of the pyramid. But as you go, as you down to the base, so you know, the majority of the surfing crowd is is you know developing skills. So uh, oh. Uh, 
I had a 511 dozer uh, that was very good. What board can replace this as my next one? Uh, the, the, the D2, what I call it, I shortened the name to D, but it's a Dwart 2. And it is uh, pretty much a Dwart. You know, it's got a fuller outline. It's got a little bit lower rocker. It's got a semi-healthy concave in the back. And instead of a Dwart with a double wing round tail, it's a... Uh, uh, a semi-full round of squash tail, and uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, if you haven't, if you, if you're kind of on a dozer program, you probably like a, a D2 or Dwart 2. Uh, <laughs> what's the best way to get into surfing? I've never been before, but somehow it's my favorite sport. Uh, Get a at least an eight foot. You know, I I thought I'd never say this, but go buy a wave store for a hundred bucks at Costco. You know, an eight six or nine zero. Oh, you know, and uh, give it a shot. Just paddle out. You know, maybe get surf. It might help to get surf lessons. You know, uh, you you don't need a surf coach out of the gate. I don't think. But you, sh you should certainly consider getting some lessons if you're really interested. But you know, you put time in, and I, I mean, I've there's guys that grow up that are fortunate enough to live very close to high quality surf breaks that are fortunate enough to have the time to surf every day, and those guys, uh, you know, within. Uh, Maybe not two years, but within three or four years, they can be become quite advanced surfers. So it's just a matter of putting in time. I, for decades, used to I used to surf almost every day, and this was just horrible. But I'd I'd always put in at least one session a day, and if not two. Um, I mean, I had a lot of friends that were were, were like that too. You know, I get uh, a lot of customs for guys that. Uh, say they're advanced and they, they surf once a month and uh, all right <laughs> but I think you know I think on, on a good average if you're really interested in surfing you should you should be able to uh, well you know it just depends on your living circumstances like where as I said if you live close to a good surf break and you have the time you, you, you should probably pick up surfing and you'd probably advance fairly quickly if you're devoted but, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are just, inter you know, beginner to intermediate, uh, maybe in intermediate skills that have a great time. They catch plenty of waves, they're surfing as good as they need to surf, or as good as they want to surf. So, and every, you know, everybody when they start out feels self-conscious, and surfing is a terrible sport for beginners <laughs> because... Uh, I, it hasn't changed much over the last 50 years, but usually... Uh, the guys at the bottom of the totem pole don't get squat. <laughs> it's just, you know, the waves are, are a limited resource. You know, there's a certain window in the day where the waves are good. It's not the same window every day. It's usually tied into the tide uh, and, and the wind and what your schedule permits. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not all about doing errors it's just you know catching catching some good ways getting some good rides and kicking out and having a good time uh, uh, let's see I own a Prana and I love it. Yeah, Prana was a Prana was kind of a fluke. It was I, I watched. This is uh, Chris uh, Chris Ward before we sponsored him. I mean, he was uh, teen, uh, late teens or something in the North Shore of Hawaii. He was surfing uh, backdoor, and uh, I think it was on a Patterson. Pretty sure it was. 
he was at, he was drawing different lines than the other sh- other surfers, but he's still like carving and getting in a barrel and doing big maneuvers. And he came in and you know, I looked at his board. And I go, wow. I go, I'm surprised you can wi- ride a board that wide out, you know, out out there. And he goes, yeah, it, ri- it rips. But it was not a fish. It, it was fuller, like maybe a 14, 14 and a half inch nose. And it was a little bit full in the middle, but it, and it had a fairly wide tail, but it stepped down with three wings into the swallow tail, and uh, shallow swallow tail is, you know, it's like, you know, most swallow tails are like six, seven, eight inches, but from corner to corner, this thing was about five inches, and it stepped it down from like a fifteen and a half inch tail, so a set of three wings, and I, I, I. I Went back to my place I was staying, and I just kind of scribbled a rough sketch on a, on a napkin, shaping room. But that was over 20 years ago, and uh, that became rapidly became our number one bestseller. It, it, it most boards that are kind of uh, you know wider, uh, they don't always necessarily end up being thicker, but they're you know usually a little bit fuller. But the Prada had a fairly thin rail, and uh, it had a decent amount of rocker, and therefore people could ride it in, in bigger ways. So it had great range. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I introduced the smoothie, which was basically a, a piranha without wings. And that caught on, and that was, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've always made like a lot of uh, alternative boards, but uh, that kind Caught on as our go-to alternative. Board. And, uh, you know, the original ones are, you know, high fives, low sixes, and I've made them up to eight, eight and a half feet long. Uh, but the Piranha is, in, in recent times, has enjoyed a, a little bit of a comeback. And I uh, had to dust the templates off, and... Uh, <laughs> Ten years ago, it finally gave it up to the Dwart. Uh, I think the Dwart. I'm not sure if the Dwart still are still. Are, it's one of our best-selling designs. But it goes to show that just you know, a little bit wider, you know, a little bit more area, a little less rocker than the average board, uh, goes a long way in average. Uh, I'm told I mumble. I hope I'm not mumbling. Okay. I'm six one two hundred pounds, decent surfer. What would you recommend? Well, Sam, how old are you? How much experience do you have? What have you been writing? I have a little short profile on the on the website that I ask you to fill out because um, you could be twenty years old or you could be sixty years old, and the answers would be quite different. Uh, but I find, you know, around 200 pounds, 190 pounds, uh, you know, 180 pounds is like a little bit above average, 190 starting to get kind of beefy, 200 you're kind of falling into a different class, and I usually find the surfers that weigh 200 plus pounds are, uh, a lot of times, uh, well, I hate to use the word delusional, but they're, delu- they're delusional about what they think they should be riding. And uh, quite often, they're riding boards that are too small. Uh, I mean, I, it's, you know, it sounds like, oh, all I do is like talk people into more volume. No, I don't. I mean, there's quite a few customers I get that I talk into less volume, uh, you know, especially beginner and intermediate surfers. Uh, but... <clears throat> Yeah, guys, 200 pounds and up. I kind of use Wade, Wade Carmichael as kind of an example as a cutoff because he's 5'11 and, you know, 190 pounds, give or take. And uh, when he first started riding for us a year ago, he was in the 29 and a half, 29 and 7 8 liters. He didn't want to go to 30 liters. But nowadays he's riding, it's just been a year, and he's riding uh, 31 and a half liters, 31 to 31 and a half liters, 5.11s, and uh, he's, 
uh, you know, his surfing speaks for itself. Uh, but when the average guy, he goes, well, I can ride what Wade rides. <laughs> yeah, you probably can, but you're probably going to not make many waves. You're probably not going to catch many waves. You're probably going to be frustrated, maybe not, because you, you, you did one big maneuver that session. But um, I'd say, you know, if you're the same size as Wade, Give it up to the fact that he's in, a, you know, he's in peak physical shape, that he's one of the better surfers in the world, and give that up to him. You know, he, if he wants to ride 30 and he can surf that well, great. But you know, even if you're like the top cat at, the, at your local break, uh, you should probably consider going a couple of, uh, at least a liter more than Wade, uh, if not a couple. And I, for every 10 pounds, your weight changes, I, I'd say roughly your volume should change about a liter. Uh, um, so I get guys that are 200 pounds, so you got to spot me that two liters off the weight factor, and then your 10 pounds heavier says three liters. See here. Uh, so yeah, you should be looking at 34, 34 and a half liters. And that's if you're truly an advanced surfer. And then, you know, the 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 chart fluctuates a little bit. Uh, I think my my chart's still you know pretty good uh, because as your uh, as your weight goes up and as your age goes up, I'm sorry, but. You know, you can probably still ride the same board you rode when you're 20 in your early 30s, but uh, it's a fact, Jack. You do, you surf, you just you can still ride shorter boards, but they need to start creeping up a little bit every every year, even if it's a half inch or an inch. But uh, yeah, do, so do yourself a favor. If you're 200 pounds, you're a decent surfer. So decent covers a wide range, but uh, I would say something 35 to 36 liter range, give or take a little bit. And uh, you, can go, you can go on our website and you can custom program a board. You, if you want to stick with a 6.1, you can have a 6.1 SD that's 18 and a half, or you can have a 6.1 SD that's, it's going to be out of proportion. It'll be 21 and a half. But yeah, I'd I'd say six one two hundred pounds decent surfer. What would you recommend for for I I a high performance shortboard maybe the SD or the Keg. Now the Keg is a back foot board. That's I had a guy I spent a lot of time programming a board for him. And as as time went by, he goes, "Well, I'm more of a front foot surfer." Wade has got a, the deepest single concave that we make. And it's, I call it the sweet spot, but it's behind center. And his, Wade's personal boards, uh, his thickness profile is shifted way back, way back. It's like there's a, most boards I try to keep them pretty balanced, but his board is at least a quarter of an inch thicker in the tail than it is the nose. And uh, we... We all, all, you know, Ado in Australia, and Pedro here, and uh, we we all agreed that we needed to. Um, and his boards had insane amount of rocker, insane. Like this, this is a five eleven, and it had the original ones had almost two and a half inches of tail rocker, and five and a quarter, five and a half inches of nose rocker, and we got we got him calmed down a little bit. His rockers dropped a little bit, uh, and his foil is balanced out a little bit. So we have what we call the consumer version of the keg. And but still you know, keep in mind that it's more of a a back foot board. If you're uh if you have more of a balanced stance, maybe the M eight. That's uh I don't know why I call it the M eight. <laughs> I think there was a shaper in Santa Cruz is is the brand name was M seven or but the M8 is still a good board. It's got fairly, it's got um, average rocker, and it's got a fairly neutral, light medium uh, concave that splits pretty early after the wide point. 
And that's been uh, that's been a pretty successful board, for, especially for bigger guys. Uh, good evening, NMC Surfboards. I follow you. Uh, you've been shaving since '88. Well, anyways, you know I like your stuff. I like what I see on, on your Instagram. <laughs> your Instagram uh, seems like you're kind of you know you have a very well-rounded uh, uh, shaping ability. Anyways, um, Mick, Nick, Nick. Good day, Mick. Good evening. Kama, Kama Miguchi. What's up, Kama? I, 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 I met Kama through Joe Kanernschild, who was kind of Bob Hurley's partner in Billabong in the, in the early mid eighties. And Kama said, I have a surf shop. And, uh, I go, well, that's good. There's a lot of surf shops in Japan. He goes, no, I have a good surf shop. I want you to come shape boards for me. And uh, the, I think the first, I think it was 86, I flew to Japan. And uh, Kama was a wonderful guy. He's, he's uh, well, he's five, you know, he's five four or something, five five. You know, I'm six, I was six four. <laughs> he's, Pretty comical when we were walking around together. His nickname for me was Kuma Bear. I was the bear, Kuma. Uh, but Joe Kernern's children introduced us, and uh, Kama has been a, a good friend and a good customer so, so for 25, 45 years. And he's son of a gun still reps. So what's up, Kama? Lauren, uh, <clears throat> thanks for your 35 years of support. Uh, you know, I really, as I said before, I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to shave her so many pros I can't even remember. Uh, but I truly get a, a great amount of pleasure out of shaping for uh, the average guy and having a relationship that develops over the years and. Uh, I've got a lot of guys that have been customers for, this, you know, 35, 40, 45 years. <laughs> but I appreciate your support. Uh, you live at Margaret River. I had property in Margaret River for years and almost built a house there. I, so my kids were in high school about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, Uh, Rob Bauer, uh, I love my Dwart. What do you recommend for a fun board? I need a mid-size fun board that's super loose for sloppy LA County. 
Um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, we have a lot of boards like the smoothie. I could make a seven six. Um, uh, the egg, the, it's still not up on the website. It's gonna, it'll be up there, but we have some at Huntington Surface for it, and uh, the people who have gotten them have loved them. I, I've been making eggs for almost fifty years, and uh, they've evolved, and this is our current incarnation of what I think is a is a great egg. It's pretty, pretty balanced. It's got a decent amount of rocker. Uh, I first started out in the skip fry uh, uh, grain, uh, where the boards are pretty flat. But over time, I've uh, given them more rocker and given them more bottom bottoms and given them a little bit thinner lower rail. The original eggs, because the rails were like an egg <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what they the outline looks like an egg but the rails were eggy too so uh, my, my rails most almost all of my rails are a little bit lower uh, I think I talked about the apex last time but maybe I'll talk about it again next time but my apexes are a little bit lower than most and uh, there's a lot of reasons that I'll get on that next trip but yeah the egg is good you know there's a smoothie um The Moby Fish, the Moby Fish is, man, that's, that thing's, I'm going to, I'm going to rave about that thing for a minute. As far as a, you know, a mid-length board, people think, I, you know, most people think, oh, it's got to be, you know, something kind of semi-eggish or whatever, but the, the Moby Fish is over 20 years old. I made the first one for myself, it was a 710, and it was meant for small days, shores and scripts, and you know, smallish days of blacks, and there was, I've told the story a million times, but there was one day I drove down the blacks, and all I had met back my truck was my Moby fish, and I looked, and I went, uh-oh, because it was big, you know, there's some sets uh, breaking on the edge of the canyon, and uh, I said, well, it's the only more to God, it's pretty damn good, so I, I took it out, and I was amazed, the Mo you know, the Moby fish is a fairly wide board, it's uh, 15 and change nose, uh, depending on the overall length and width, and a pretty wide swallowtail. And uh, I've pretty much only ridden it as a quad, and I was surprised that they worked uh, so good at blacks. It just, it would take off and it would hold a high line, which is usually what you need in blacks if it's good. Uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, for uh, decades it's been in terms of our bigger boy boards and cruiser boards, it's been one of our best sellers. And uh, I have a lot of friends that are my age that ride them, and their sons are are pretty darn good surfers, like at the La Jolla Reefs. And they've ridden their father's Moby fishes, and they freak, and they go, oh, "I want a Moby fish." And I go, "Well, how you know how much narrower, how much shorter?" And they go, "No, I want one just like my dad's." And they ride them a big dunam here, and. and uh, all over the place so yeah I'd say the egg if you want more of a cru uh, uh, you know it's a cruiser but it's a more high performance uh, mid length and then the Moby Fish the, you know one of those two would be good just uh, go online and uh, play around with those guys and uh, you can contact us and, and uh, you know I'll get in touch with you uh, it's eight o'clock. Uh, <laughs> greetings from Panama. Greetings right back at ya. I, uh, I hate to sign off, but it's eight o'clock. I might do this again. Instead of, I used to do it once a week, uh, and then I switched to once a month, uh, thinking now I might do it every other week, so... Keep posted in a couple of weeks. Maybe we can do this again. 